Welcome to episode 46. On this episode, we have Danny Winterbates from Berry Tomorrow. Yeah, in the episode, we talk all about you know what Danny's been doing during the lockdown with, with his uh, safe spaces on his Instagram. A little bit of writing uh, the record Cannibal, uh, but that's covered mainly on his the YouTube channel, which you go look at. But you'll find that out in the podcast anyway. Uh, obviously we talk about horror movies pet peeves and much much more and if you do enjoy this episode which you probably will let's be honest make sure you check out Danny's Instagram with the safe space episodes where there is so many good conversations that are well worth a listen to whilst you're at it as well you might as well check out all of our other episodes on YouTube where you can see all of our lovely faces speaking to various lovely people um, and if you want to know who we're getting on the podcast before the episode's released, if you're wanting to throw in any questions, potentially, why don't you join our Discord? The we are nice people. We, we like to chat. It's all yeah. good. We have a good natter on there. Other than that, though, enjoy the episode. Enjoy. Danny Winterbits, how's it going, man? Oh, good. I cannot. Well, I can complain, but I won't complain. It'd be pretty. <laughs> it'd be pretty bleak start to a podcast, wouldn't it? Like, how are you? Fucking terrible, man. I'm negative immediately. <laughs> no, I'm good, thank you. How about you guys? Good man. Plodding through yeah. this thing called life at the minute. I yeah. think that's the uh, that's the main thing, isn't it? So, it, as we just mentioned before, this just to break the ice in this conversation. So, we've me and Matty have briefly met you at your last Manchester show but it was kind of we didn't actually meet because because we went to uh we went to interview Blood Youth and we yeah. spoke to Kaya and we had a great chat and stuff like that and then Kaya shut off doing whatever he was doing and we were left to pack up and we must have been there about 20 minutes and we got shut out but it was the same time that you guys were heading on to stage yeah, 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 yeah. so we headed out of like the canteen room saw you guys come and we were like shit, shit yeah shit. Uh... <laughs> you look like you look like you was getting pumped up ready for the show we just wonder how it kind of block your way as you're going towards the stage and like oh shit <laughs> <Staying on somewhere. laughs> but yeah man that was like one of the last shows that i went to oh god no problem oh. Magic of editing will be okay. Hey, can you guys talk? Sorry, I just had... Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry, yeah. Can you hear testing, me? testing, one, two. For one, some two. reason, my, um, my earphones have just died, so go as long on. as you guys haven't got any um, any bleed on your end, I'll go through my speakers. How's yeah, this? no, that's not a problem. I, I do have a power ball, uh, like a snowball, so it shouldn't, you shouldn't yeah, be at it. But yeah, um, carry on. I heard up to you saw us coming on stage and you were doing the awkward thing of stood in a corridor going. <laughs> Shit, yeah, we didn't well, we did, we did, we did know which way to go and we could see you guys all pumped up ready to go on and you was heading towards the stage like man on a mission and we were just stood in the corridor like where the fuck did we go? <laughs> like blocking you in. <laughs> Bro, so the funny thing that you say that is that it just conjures. So this is how things work, right? So in my head, I was like, I was transported back to playing Greenfields when we did it in Switzerland. Um, and it's one of the best festivals on the planet, really. Like we played like Limp Bizkit, we're playing our time, Slipknot played it. But it's like a, like to give anyone a bit of a mindset of this festival, right? So it's in the mountains in Switzerland. You play it when you play, you're looking up at these mountains, right? It's picturesque. It's Ooh. always scorchingly hot best um catering you've ever had in your life like michelin starred stuff like and you can see bands like slipknot in a capacity of like i don't know 15 20 000 capacity place like as a festival no, so fuck. it's pretty epic right so you've got slipknot one day ramstein another day you had in flames playing um playing i think like come clarity in full you had um yeah limp biscuit slipknot ramstein playing a like 15,000 capacity venue like it was mental yeah. so amazing the best time you've ever had and the reason why I was spectacularly transported back to that moment was I was getting a bit drunk having the best time of my life after like it was the best show we ever played we pl ended up playing on a second stage in front of about 15,000 people it was mad all the people came to watch us and uh we were backstage. I think England had just won a leg of the World Cup as well. So it was like the best day you've ever had. <laughs> and I'm there walking down thinking, all right, I'm going to grab a couple of beers from the dressing room. I'm going to go watch Limp Bizkit. Um, one of their guys had invited, I think it may have been Wes, like we were speaking to and invited us to come on 
like on side stage we're like sick of course we will nice. and uh and like i'd seen wes in like normal clothes right so you know obviously wes balling from limp biscuit yeah yeah naturally wears a lot of stuff yeah like and it's different every time i hadn't seen him for ages walking back to the dressing room quickly i'm in a corridor like this walking down <laughs> And suddenly, and I was with Jacko actually at the same time. We both had like half half drunk beers in our hands, like no hands to be like do anything. Walking along, I see Limp Biscuit doing exactly the same thing as what you just mentioned. <laughs> literally, two massive security guys. Um, you had you had Fred in the middle, red cap to the back, yes. like on his way with his gloves on. You had Wes. Yeah, John Arto, they were all there oh, coming man. in the formation, <laughs> right? So, and they would not, they were not going to move. Like, there was no way that Limp Biscuit before stage are going to stop their stride. So, I'm like this. That <laughs> goes like this. And all we did, I'm not even joking, we faced the wall. <laughs> pretty much pretended that we were the wall. So, literally, we were like this. <laughs> Walk past. And then they would have seen, uh, this is what makes me laugh every time, is that they would have seen us side stage with our beers after, just like, they're the guys that <laughs> are a fucking wall. So yeah, I was just, it's not as awkward as you think, because I've done it many times. Another story with that, I'm not going to take up your whole podcast. But no, I'd love no, this. We can talk, yeah, we can do the whole bit. thing, just limp it if you want. <laughs> My ridiculous stories, yeah. So another one, we played um, Grass Pop, I think it was, and John Davis was playing all these name drops. I don't know any of these people <laughs> at all. So like, it's not a name drop. I love, I love them, but they don't love me. So, um, <laughs> so I had two beers in my hand, common theme to this story at a festival, having a great yep. time. Grass pop was one of our, one of our favorites. Um, really drunk, as you can imagine. I, I love Queen of the Damned. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. It's really cheesy, really awkward, but Stuart Towson playing Lestat the Vampire is one of my favorite, like reimaginings of um, a novel. So like, I'm not very cultured, so Queen of the Damned was my take on that. So I loved it as a kid. And he played uh, three of the Queen of the Damned songs at this at the show as Lestat the Vampire. And I, I'd never thought in my life I'd ever see these songs. Like when I was like 15, they were like my favourite songs. I had them on my MySpace and it, it was like my favourite thing. So he played these shows. I'm absolutely loving it. He's coming off stage. I'm going back into the festival arena. And our dressing room is like really close to there. It's like almost like next to each other. I'm walking back and I see him coming and I'm like, I've got to tell him it was a great show. Like, no doubt about it. Like the usual awkward, like great show, mate. Great show. <laughs> yeah. I was like, he's just, <laughs> yeah. he's just going to say great show. But then in my head, I got in my head and started thinking like, what happens if he like wants to shake my hand or something like, and am I going to put my hand out and shake his? Or is he going to shake my hand? This is John Davis. So this is all going yeah. on in the 25 seconds I have. And I see him and I've got double, double cans in my hand. I just go like this. So he watches, <laughs> he watches me, we meet eyes. He watches me go and then put my hand out and shake his hand and go, amazing. He was like, you really thought so, man? I was like, literally like, yes, but you just <laughs> chucked my two beers behind me. He couldn't play it cool. I was just like, mate, I love the Sat the Vampire. But yeah, so I've been there probably more times than you guys have been there. So don't ever feel awkward for doing that. And you should have just gone, you guys look well serious or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> There was a part two to that because we we went from that to we had these passes which were like went oh you can go to the side of the stage and we're like should we should we just go and watch Barry tomorrow should we just uh, should we just go finish this interview stroll out and go to the side of the stage and just go with the flow so then <laughs> we ended up speaking to this guy who was next to the door to where you guys must have gone and we're like can we go through there <laughs> with this pass it's like a proper Wayne's World moment yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're like can we can we do this and it was just like. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> okay, <laughs> mate, you get, mate, you get it, bro. Like, it's, I still get that, mate. Honestly, like, and I know it sounds, I still get that. I'm in a band, like, but I'm, <laughs> like, I'm just saying it because I'm used to passes. You know, I know what they all mean. Like, I know, vice versa, all that kind of stuff. And like, there is actually quite a hierarchy of differences in some places. Like, some people tour with like 25 different laminates, like, and they all mean different things. Like for us, like, we tend to these days probably tour with like a a AAA so like our dressing room and everything like that kind of stuff like top that's that you can go anywhere really and you yeah. can escort as well that's usually the difference you can escort people that don't have laminates backstage and then for some sometimes on some tours if it's like a short tour and we don't know the bands too well we'll have a support one as well which is then they they've got 
and they can go everywhere. Obviously, they can come side stage. They can even knock our dressing room, come in, of course, but they can't escort. So that's one of the differences. So right. obviously, right. as you can imagine, if you don't know people, you suddenly got <laughs> 200 people backstage yeah. and you're like, yeah. who are you? <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I've been the same on a tour and just been like, I'm not sure I can go up there. And like, so, so when we did Parkway, we didn't overly know Parkway too well. And they got fire. So that when you have fire... <laughs> There's a big difference. You can't go yeah. anywhere. You are not allowed to go on a stage. And I, I remember like looking at my laminate and just like looking up and looking at the guy side stage, there, like um, stage manager, and him just going. And I was like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, think, I think I said to him, AAA doesn't mean AAA then, does it? And just like one slunk away into the background. Oh, I didn't want to come in anyway. I just wanted to like go out in, outside. Yeah, whilst we're on the subject as well of like meeting like different like celebrities and artists and stuff, like I met I met like Bam Mojo a while back who I looked up to as a kid loads, and I had that same moment <laughs> where like he walked past and I just froze, like I didn't know what to do. <laughs> like I went watching him when he was playing, like he was touring with this band that he had at the time, but he literally walked past and I froze, and I, I just didn't know what to do because I was like I fucking been watching you on like TV for so long, and it's yeah, just man. A weird, weird experience. But why I'm on it as well. Sorry, go on. We were really similar with him, man. Like I was the same. Like I grew up like watching Viva La Bam. Like yeah, I watched yeah. like Jackass. Like I was a him fan. Obviously, I can see a poster above your head. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, I didn't quite get a heartogram, which I'm pretty glad about these days. Tattooed on me that, but it is what it is. Um, but I was um, I we met him on like a show. So I'd never met him in like a fan capacity, but we were playing the same show together, and um, he was back. Said he was so drunk. That it was one of those awkward moments where I like, I think I walked away because I didn't want him to ruin what I liked of him. And I'm a skater yeah, as well. So like, yeah, me, yeah. Bam was like, he was one of the best at mini yeah. ramp. Like he was the, the dog's bollocks when it his came to like. His videos just had style, didn't they? He used to won, man. And then he wrecked style. his foot and he got like overweight and kind of lost his way a little bit. And, you know, substance abuse and all that kind of stuff. Like, but it was such a shame when he couldn't skate anymore. So like him and Chad Musker were like two of my biggest tragedies, not seeing them skate anymore. Yeah. And then met him. And I was like, it just got to the stage where you were like, Oh, you're starting to go there. And I was like, I'm going to walk away. Lovely to meet you, Bam. Bye. <laughs> just like, yeah. In my head, he's a cool dude. So that's yeah. yeah. Yeah, man was only a brief experience and it was it was nice from uh he asked me where the element store was and I was like, I'm not a fucking clue, man. <laughs> I I'd only been to Liverpool like, like a handful of times, but you I wish I could have took him there. Yeah, I should have just walked around <laughs> like aimlessly. <laughs> not to be sure in stories of who we've met, but I had a, a similar one to you, Danny, where I went to a Limp Biscuit show with my brother and we bumped into oh. Gabe, the tour manager. Oh, nice, yeah. And I was like, fuck yeah, and Gabe went, Do you want to meet the band? And we were like, no, no, thanks. Yeah, of course we want to meet the band. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, go upstairs. So sat down. He's like, do you want a beer? It was great. And I'm like a shy, chubby kid at this point, play drums. And John Otto walks out yeah. and I was like, hi, John. Go sit down, drink my beer and chat to Wes. But my brother was like whispering in my ear, if you don't ask him, you never will ask him. I was like, all right. Started asking him about drums. And I know looking now, John's a very introverted yeah. yeah, he doesn't do many interviews, and that's fair enough. But he told me just keep practicing, and I was like, "Damn, that's it." Like, I was expecting like <laughs> you've got to learn this rudiment, and you'll be a, a king dr drummer. But no, and I was like, "Damn, mate, that's it. That's a proper reflection." I can say this because I am a drummer as well. Like, it's a proper reflection of uh, drummers, though, mate. Like, a lot of it is just that, just practicing, yeah. like whatever. Like, but it, yeah, I get what you're saying. It's like a. Uh, it's a bit of a cop out because yeah. you're like, tell me, tell me your your wisdom. Yeah. And what do you warm up with? Like, oh, it's fine. You don't need to know. <laughs> tell me, wise man. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, it's awkward. So I watched your video as well, Dan. You're always going through your favorite albums and what like inspired you as a musician. And yeah. I saw obviously Papa Roach Infest was like your first one on there. Yeah. What was it like when you met them for the first time? Because I bet that was fucking crazy. <laughs> yeah, man. Like what was weird about that is I never saw Papa Roach before playing. Like because I joined the band like super early. So I joined the band when I was 16. And so like a lot of my firsts were being in the band. So yeah, it was yeah. like, you know, 
like first festival I ever went to was being in a band like and that's really strange so for a lot of people they've got like the experience of download or Reading and Leeds or um, Isle of Wight Festival or Bloodstock or whatever that is they'd all experienced that and I hadn't so I was touring Europe when I was 16 like I'd left college and was just trying to live the dream and you know trying to make money and stuff and and grafting like real hard when we first started um, and just dropped out I was like right I'm, I'm in a band we got signed to Artery or oh, we thought we were getting signed to Sumerian actually. And we got a call at like 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm diverting a little bit, but it does come back. But like we got this call at 3 a.m. and it was like, and I remember Dav running in because obviously he's my brother and he ran in and was like, mate, I just got this call from Sumerian Records because we'd given him a demo and put the number in. And he got a phone on the house phone because that was what the era was, right? House phone rings at 3 a.m. You can imagine my mom and dad like, what the <laughs> fuck is going on? And, um, and he came in and we're like, Sumerian want to sign us. Like they want to sign us. He's, he's literally just said it was like a movie. You know what? Like when you hear about music, yeah. movie moments, like, and yeah. it probably was like the last, I would say, era of that as far as like, you know, and maybe I'm a bit jaded because I know the music industry a little bit more now, obviously a little bit more, a lot more now, but like it was probably the last era that you get a call like that. I think, I think nowadays it's like, you know, you get big online or, you service your record and people already know it and yeah. then a label will go yeah sick do you want it and you have those you're almost on a par which is where it probably should be if i'm honest like bands should have the power not the labels so yeah. but the, like getting that call i was like what the fuck like this is insane so the reason why i say that is like going back to the story is like so i'd never seen Papa Roach, never seen them and we were playing some shows with them and this was like quite far in our career so like i'm like talking runes era like post like probably post runes era moving into earthbound era so we're like doing all right and uh and we were head support to pa uh, papa roach as well in like this like fifteen thousand capacity venue it was mental and we're playing three shows with him and jace comes running around he will hate me for telling you this because he's so <laughs> serious he um he came running around and was like dan 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 you have to come with me and jace never runs he doesn't like running so <laughs> bad he was running, something's happened someone's broken their leg or someone's done something and uh, he was like gotta come here you gotta come here you gotta come here ran to this corner and then stopped and went jacoby's there and we went up and and i met him and he was like everything that you think of him like he was like and i mean that in the greatest possible respect like did you you i know you will have done um old matty ashton you'd have watched this but um the uh would you watch scarred totally scarred yeah, yeah. Do you remember that yeah oh yeah. he's scarred right so brutal stuff on that but he was like totally scarred man and it was always like <laughs> everything was like that it's like rock and roll man the biggest <laughs> and star ever and like especially of that era and he was like that like fully like oh my god danny lovely to meet you man i fucking love your band and i was literally just That's like sick what <laughs> and, uh, like, and no joke it was like that and like i met you know i met wes Borland and slipknot and you know i met um not all of slipknot but i met sid and Corey and stuff and like they're all sick dudes but like they got no fucking idea who we are like wes Borland probably does um but like they don't have a fucking clue who we are Jacoby Shaddix knew exactly our band and he could name songs off our, of our band. And I was literally like, lot, oh my God. And he's like, mate, I can't wait to watch you guys. And he was naming like yeah. UK bands. So he was naming like While She Sleeps and Bleed and stuff like that. So like a guy that's got his finger on the pulse of like music, yeah. obviously yeah. Yeah. not knowing the real subcultures and the local <laughs> bands, but he, you know, he knew the, the, the guys that were doing stuff in the UK, which was really nice to hear. And, um, and he was like, mate, I'm going to come watch Side Stage. And I remember like, two songs in just turn around he's there like and um jerry was there and stuff and i was just like this is insane um and then we've just stayed like not jacoby so much but like papa roach and barry tomorrow have kind of got a really good relationship since those shows like they'll retweet us and we'll retweet them and i know it sounds like yeah. a bit but, but it's like it's nice when you get that mutual respect because i think for them like also there's a lot in the industry about like bravado and stuff like of people you know you don't want to you don't want to promote a band like we don't because you don't really care but like some bands don't want to <laughs> no. but some bands don't want to promote other bands because it, it will get them above them on stuff yeah. and that's just like i mean it's business in it but we we tend to just end up promoting loads of people and they end up getting bigger than us which is brilliant um it makes us <laughs> laugh um but like we uh we don't like with papa roach like you know they're papa roach that it doesn't matter if they drop off they're still papa roach yeah, so yeah, like they can just promote people and be happy about it and 
there's something innocent about like meeting someone like that that you're like i i am a front man because of jacoby shaddix fact foremost i have not ever seen or felt a band that i have outweighed that band for me in that time so when i was like 13 14 like infest was well, probably less i was probably about 12 infest was like my album it got me i took me from being a drummer to being a front man it made me want to write songs that were catchy it made me want to be a front man like and so to go all full circle and you know it's, and it's mental man like we're talking about playing similar venues now like it's it's just opposite well not right now obviously but mm. <laughs> <laughs> but when all this madness is over yeah sorry to divert on that one but <laughs> no, that's not <laughs> no, that's a story. yeah i'm guessing that's a highlight for you looking back now then yeah no doubt man like there's a lot though bro like and this yeah, is one yeah. of the things that like, we're doing cheeky exclusive we're doing our own podcast at the moment we're starting like the bt kind of chronicles around like the heroes of the band so which is something we've never done before and it's all new to us so like it's going to be really cool to to talk about the different eras that's essentially what we're going to be doing so like portraits era union era all that kind of stuff which i think people will really enjoy hopefully um but like we were talking about this like what's your highlights what you know what what do you remember and like it's weird it's like objectively being outside of your own body like an out-of-body experience and you try and think about those you know 14 years of being in the music industry like the the proper highs like you know headlining our first venue like you know going back to joiners in southampton 150 capacity selling that out was like probably as good a feeling as playing 200,000 people at reading and leeds or something yeah, like do you know what i mean it's like yeah. is it, at that point that was the pinnacle and then yeah. the next time we do it, it's like, oh, we're headlining Islington Academy. I remember being like, oh my God, like 900 people. This is the most insane thing that's ever happened. And and the same as like, you know, Manchester Ritz, like blowing us away when we played there. It was like, and that's not even that long ago, you know? And so, yeah, yeah. yeah there's definitely was a highlight. Definitely meeting some of these people. and But it also is reaffirming that they're just human beings. Like, you know, I base my life on the fact that everyone's a human being and I don't really care who they are. I'm not going to... I'm not going to suddenly, <laughs> Kobe Shaddix aside, I'm probably not. <laughs> I'm probably not going to venerate them as to a point because they can disappoint you if they aren't like that. And yeah. it's an unfair expectation to put on people as well. I think so. Like, I tend to never get starstruck, and I've now I've said three stories where I do, but <laughs> tend to be like uh, like bands like our peers, for example. So you know the the Parkways and the Parkways and the Architects and the August Burns Reds and Kill Switch and all of that. Like I am, I love them for what they do and, and i respect them for all of what they've done for our genre but i'm not going to sit here and start shaking because i shake hands with them like it, we're peers and that's yeah, what we do yeah, but yeah there are those people those special people that you can look and be like yeah you you were a big influence on my life not just a big influence on the band you know i think if you ever met dave Grohl, I'd <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you just melt into yourself uh, yeah, I probably was. <laughs> just become a puddle <laughs> but i think we're, we're kind of all guilty of doing that of like idolizing especially bands we grow up listening to because mm-hmm. in our scene it's it shapes who you are it's it's a whole subculture isn't it so yeah no doubt man on i pedal still i think you're right and i just think like i've spent a long time trying to make peace with being that guy that's like anti that do you know what I mean? And like, I, I had a lot of angst when I was younger, like a lot, even in like Earthbound era of being like, you know, fuck the media, I'm not going to listen to magazines anymore because they're just people like, I'm not going to make friends with bands just to kind of get my band on. Like if they don't like us and they don't support our fans then I'm not going to support that band and we're not going to yeah. tour with them. And like, yeah. and like, albeit that's still very much an ethos of our band. Has it damaged our band? Probably in places like, you know, we're not best friends with loads of bands. We're friends with the bands that we have a mutual love for each other is not not music music aside like we tour with them and we become really close and they respect us and we respect them but there's plenty of people in the music industry that don't like us plenty of people like lots and lots and lots and we polarize a lot of people in the metal world for really heavy people and really like people and that's just metalcore and and so i think i spent a long time trying to make peace with the fact that i hate it when people believe their own hype when they believe that they're anything more than lucky. Like, yeah, and I still yeah. believe that, like I just am less angry about it because like, you know, I'm no, I, everyone has to go on their journey and I, and I, and that, it sounds really altruistic when I say that and really hippie, but like they do, like everybody legit has to go on their own path and journey. And I think COVID especially 
has probably put more people in that level where they're like, you're not a God, you know, you're not a God. Your music hasn't taken you to a place where you can survive something like this. Um, yes, you know, you're really lucky. And I've always said this about COVID as well. Like I'm lucky because I work for the NHS as well. So like I have a job, I'm all right. But like we still earn money off the band and we have done this whole year. And as tragic as it is, the hundreds, and I'm talking hundreds of thousands of pounds worth of fees we've lost over last year and probably most of this year, it's it's disgusting the amount of money that we aren't earning. It's also on the bigger flip side, amazing that we were even in a position based on people liking our music that we can lose that. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. surely at very least, if we're, you know, and it's not easy because there's a lot of times that I'm pissed. Of course I'm pissed off. I can't play a show. Of course I'm pissed off. I can't tour, but there will come a point when hopefully all of those people will reflect back and say, well, actually we're really, really lucky to do this. And when we get back to playing shows, which we will, hopefully that will reignite something in people's brains to be like, let's respect our fans. Let's not, you know, hide away backstage because actually when pandemic didn't, didn't um, um, discriminate against the people that it affected, like it affected all of us. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I'm not going to treat crew, you know, like I'm not saying that we did, but like as a band member, not going to treat crew like shit because they're not yeah, yours yeah. to do that to. They're human beings that lost all their money as well. Like, and it just goes on and on. And I think like, that's hopefully going to be a really good silver lining with, with COVID that's kind of set reset things for people because everybody's just going to want to play that show you know and yeah and, and i think you're right like pedestals is just a, it's a disease of of music industry like people you watch it and you will have seen it and you know you guys know as, as good as i do because yes i know the people and i can see them backstage and hear what they say as you guys have done in the past i'm sure but you'll see it you'll see the people that change you'll see that album come out and you're like mm, the messaging around that album is very like we're amazing <laughs> and we don't care what people think about us and like as much as i'm all for progression and people doing their thing as musicians and like really expressing themselves it's also you're only as good as the fans that are in front of you that is it yeah. we've known that since day one playing a pub in front of one person to headlining roundhouse and playing in front of three thousand people like We've always known that and people need to recognize that. Like if they go away, it's bloody awkward, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. I've, I think it's been strange with the past year overall, because I was discussing this with uh, Pearson before, where because um, obviously we're not doing shows, we're not doing anything else. It's then taking the time to kind of like work out in a weird way, your purpose outside of music, because that's all you know. So it's taken mm -hmm. away that ego factor from it, because it's like, well, who are you as a person? Because you're not being productive with this. You're not being productive with that anymore. What can you do to, which will kind of be good for the soul as such, but yet mm -hmm. kind of keeps you going as a person and keeps you like mentally sane as but such? That's probably the last step, I would say, bro, of like, of what's going on like and what's yeah. happened so like that is when you come to a place where you can make peace with the fact of the craziness that has been this year and that's like wow i've got to that place where i can say what's my purpose who am i it's a big big question to answer yeah, like really. we're all trying to do that through life you know yeah. and there'll be junctures in our life where we go actually this isn't for me like whether that's being in a band or whether that's you know there will come a point where i go i can't do this anymore like whether it's physically or mentally or you know our band has dropped off or whatever that may be like there will come a point that it happens and i'm sure um hopefully it's long a long time away but like but at this moment in time what we've done is we've created this odd what well, we haven't created it it's happened this odd world where everybody's questioning all of this stuff but at the moment what we've done and i don't think many people have got to even that stage of like no. oh wow like i know what i can do or i'm learning i think people are in the stage of like everything i love has been taken away from me yeah, everything yeah. that made me me and and i think the hardest people to fall will be those people that put themselves on a pedestal because they believe i'm a god i'm going to release albums people should worship me it just comes to me you know or you've you've heard it many yeah. times over you know in the rock yeah. industry metal industry it's it's you are not exempt in the metal industry of a lot of assholes being like i'm a god my fans they love me i could do whatever i want I've heard those stories backstage. I've heard people say those words. I've heard many bands call fans punishers behind their back. 
You know, I've heard many fans say, I'm, uh, bands go, oh, I'm not going to go out because they're weird. I don't like them. It's like, mate, they're your fans. They're the people that pay your wage. And, and they're the people that will have dropped off really hard on this time. Yeah. And hopefully that drop off will have made them bounce into a place that's a little bit more realistic of life. And yeah. like, you know, you should appreciate people a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. It's crazy because it comes back around because these are the times where things like music, we need it the most as well. <laughs> it is tough, man. Yeah. It yeah. Is tough. But I think because of COVID, so I personally, how do I say this? So I think because of COVID, people are realizing, let's just jump into it. But mental health is like a serious thing. A lot of people I know don't take it very seriously. And mm-hmm. I think you know, you see people like taking up, oh, I have all this time. So now I've, I've started gardening. There was a, a fucking influx in people buying flour. I couldn't get flour <laughs> to make pizza. So people are fucking baking sourdough at home. Like good on them. But it's these like little things where people like have this meditative like function. Like I see it with Lun all the time. Lun loves his coffee. So he- he'll spend ages brewing a good cup of coffee. <laughs> And because it comes like a routine, it's it's like this meditative thing where you get time alone to yourself, which not yeah. a lot of people, I think, do. Yeah, mate, you're absolutely right. It's a mindful activity. Like, yeah. like hobby, that's the reason why a lot of monotonous hobbies are so great for the soul. It's the reason why people like yoga. It's the reason why people like, you know, coffees. And because it's a process, as you said, like it's, it's also something you get an end product as well. So like yeah, it's, yeah. you do all of this, it's a really mindful and, in the moment you don't have to think about it you just do and you get to the stage where you get a product that makes you happy at the end and i think that you're right gardening or baking and stuff like that but i think you're right with your first statement of like people don't people don't necessarily take it seriously i think they will a lot more <laughs> yeah yeah that's what yeah. i mean it's the it's, great leveler kind of thing oh no doubt man everybody universally there is not you have to be a pretty narcissistic human to a not in this year that we've spent and a bit. So we're about a year and a month now or a year and a couple of weeks since it yeah. really started. Yeah. Like to have not have at one time questioned how you feel if you're okay. And if people around you are okay, because if you haven't done that, then you are probably narcissistic because a lot of people like who are the strongest, most resilient <clears throat> know that even the people that are like really open about their mental health and like, you know, and I would class myself as one of those people that yeah, I've absolutely. learned a lot about what I do. I support a lot of people through their mental health because that helps me. It's all helping each other. But yeah. even like today, it's been one of the worst days I've ever had. Like literally. And I sat there and I thought I can't cancel on these guys again because, and also <laughs> it helps me because of my like mental state, like having this chat with you guys, I'll be able to go away from that and reflect now and say, I had this really crap day. But actually that moment was a moment where we could have a laugh and we had fun and it was good. And um, this will have impacted my day positively. And that's super important to be able to reflectively do that because otherwise everything's crap. Everything's crap. And you'll get to the end of the day and go, or the end of the week or the end of the month, the end of the year, and you'll go, oh my God, everything was crap. But it wasn't. There were moments probably that you sat and went, wait, actually that moment, that conversation, that cup of tea, that cup of coffee, that garden and that thing, you'd be able to look back and say, no, that was good. Like, I enjoyed that. And yeah, I think you're right. I think it will level people out, hopefully. We can only hope anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think people don't do what you've just said and reflect on the day as a whole and see how it's gone. I had crippling anxiety today because I knew I was going to speak to you. <laughs> and I was, honestly, I, what we do, we're all working from home at the minute. So we all jump in Discord. Yeah, and just chat to one another, but get on with our work just to stay in touch. That's cool. These guys know I was shitting myself, and now that I'm here, I'm like, why was I shitting myself? What, yeah, what about it? What about it? I don't know. It, honestly, it's because I've listened to Barry tomorrow. I know your band, and I'm like, how the fuck am I chatting to yourself? But at the end of the day, we're in this call, and you're just a person, mate. We're literally exactly the same. Like yeah. it's, and I know that sounds it's super like lame. I think when bands are like, oh, we're all the same, bros. <laughs> what well, we're not the same. We're just really lucky. That is yeah. it. Like we're not the same. Like you know, I wrote a bloody song about it, and I, like, we're all the same. But like, <laughs> it's, but, <laughs> black flame. Um, but it's, but at the end of the day, we're not. Like we're super lucky. But you know, and that's the thing. I, I think like with BT, our messaging a lot of the time is not like woe is us. 
Like we're not like, oh, the music industry is so shit. Like fuck that. It is. It's really bad. It's, yeah. It promotes negative mental health, and a lot of the magazines, labels, radio stations are part of that. They they perpetuate the problem. But I'm not going to sit here and say that um it sucks. You know, it's crap to be in it because actually then I have a choice. I have a really easy choice um, to make. You either do it or you don't do it, uh, you know? And, yeah. and I know that sucks, but like, it's, that is as That's simple so as it is because the positives outweigh the negatives for me anyway. So, but yeah, it's, it's just interesting, man. And don't ever be nervous to talk to a band member. Like I just, I know, I know we've talked just before about how being nervous, but like they, if they, and I know this sounds really bleak and like, it will sound bleak and, and, don't let it make you completely the opposite and be like, fuck you guys. Okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> but if they aren't into your time and making your product or whatever you guys are doing, like whether it's an interview, whether it's a podcast, whether it's just meeting you as a human being, if they are visibly not into that, um, you know, everyone has a bad day. Of course they do. Yeah, absolutely. If they're not into it. They're not worth your time to put on it because they're not going to give you enough of themselves in your interview or your podcast or whatever you're doing to warrant it taking it any further people will go oh well they phone that and that's like every other interview that I've, I've done if the yeah. people that are into it and they want to hear from you they're <laughs> the people that you want to catch and be like ah let's cat let's get them yeah. talking you know and i won't stop talking so i will for a little bit <laughs> <laughs> now that's a good thing isn't that the idea of a podcast that goes on and on <laughs> it's just it's not a danny just a danny podcast <laughs> not yet <laughs> yeah, <so>. yet <laughs> while we're on the subject obviously you've been doing your weekly um instagram live haven't you uh, somebody space. safe space what's that been like speaking to other artists about their mental well-being and like seeing it from what it's like from their perspective because i know from like like you said like showing people especially like musicians of like different statures that they're just humans as well going through the similar stuff that you were so yeah what's what's that been like like the best most nerve-wracking most stressful thing i've ever done i think <laughs> like it's i'm like really bad at practicing what i preach in that sense like i'm really bad at like <laughs> taking time for myself so because i just ruminate and i'm like i need to do more i need to do more i need to connect with people i need to just help i need to put stuff out and it sounds like i'm being all like oh yeah martyrdom but it's not it's just part of my mental health like part of my ocd like intrusive thoughts is like i'll wake up and be like i can do more i've got this idea for it like wellness wednesday i just popped up in my head on tuesday night or monday night and i was like three in the morning like i've got to do that so i wrote it on my notes like i'm gonna do that i'll lob that out on tuesday and then that'll be it so i made a plan like and so my brain works like that and so in that aspect it's quite stressful because it's like I've got to organize it. I've committed to it. It was supposed to be up until Christmas. It's now January, the end of January. <laughs> I've done 15 episodes. Uh, no, 17 episodes of it now. Um, but also the best side of it is exactly what you just said, like, you know, connecting with people, hearing real stories, um, you know, like meeting, like talking to band members that I know on a different level. You know, yeah. that is yeah. because I've never combined the NHS and what I do at the NHS, which is very similar, which is, you know, helping people, supporting them through difficult times and difficult conversations, supporting our executives to be able to understand things from people like ours perspective, you know, the alternative subculture. And I'm lucky that, you know, somewhere has put me in a senior management position with the NHS looking like I do, you know, they, they respect me and they understand what I do. And, and so from that, like, I've always had that in the NHS. So people are kind of always like, well, we know you've done all that because you've got all these credentials with the band stuff. It's like, they know I'm a front man, but I'm sure that a lot, most of a lot of the people on that call bar, maybe like Sam Carter, because we, we know each other as far as like have played so many shows together. It'd be hard for him not to know what I'm about. Um, and Rao maybe because like we've talked about mental health in the past, but everybody else has no clue about that. So they probably think yeah, oh, yeah. I'm a front man doing a thing for a bit of engagement. Yeah. probably like uh, you know would i think would i judge someone i hope not but i would be a bit like okay what is this for you know do they do they match up to their credentials you know so in that part it's been really interesting kind of showing your hand a little bit to be like like this has been my journey and i'm super open about it this is what i believe in what about you and like they've all been so different like um jake lurs was like super inspirational 
like he's a super inspirational guy like he's done so much but i never knew about some of his past stuff that had gone on you know having a breakdown and like all of that kind of stuff and you know going through the stuff he did in his personal life um you know sam i know so sam was a bit different so sam was just being sam and talking about life which is cool Rao was super knowledgeable like the most knowledgeable human i he's so intelligent it blows my mind and so bringing up like studies and everything other. wasn't he yeah, I, mean, I watched that. Yeah, he was, he's an <laughs> academic. Yeah, he's man. a proper academic, and he he knows what he's doing, and he's really intelligent. He's a really like thoughtful guy. But we were batting stuff off each other. So like, I'd mentioned a couple of things, and he actually afterwards wrote to me saying like, "Oh, could you like send me the who that was, and like you know almost like reference nice. it so he could go and read up on it." Which I was yeah. like, "Mate, that shows you, uh... <laughs> you know, you're amazing." Um, Tim was hard. Tim worried me a lot. I, I was really scared about that. If I'm really openly honest and yeah. I will be open with you guys, like I shit myself at that. And it wasn't because of Tim's like <clears throat> him as Azalea dying, because obviously we've cited many times that our band is influenced by Azalea dying. It's Dawson's favorite band of all time. He's got confide lyrics tattooed on him. Like he, he you know, he, we started because of Azalea dying, you know, yeah. as a certain element, it's more of how much it polarizes the scene. And like, what he did is, you know, is horrible. It's yeah, horrible. Yeah. And where he was in his life to be able to do that, I'll never understand, you know, mm. but he, I have never also had the opportunity and I've always wanted to go into prisons and talk to prisoners about mental health because it's a yeah. lot of bravado in prisons, a lot. And so for me as a tattooed guy, and I saw him smile a little bit because he's so bloody big that I bet he was like, yeah, you get eaten alive, mate. But, um, <laughs> But I was like saying like, you know, I've always, I was invited into one of the prisons um, over in the Isle of Wight, which are pretty bad prisons over there. Mm. Um, I think it's Camp Hill or Parkhurst over there, which are pretty tough places to be. I think Bronson was there for a little bit and stuff. So yeah. it's pretty epic. Um, but I just, it just never worked. And so having the opportunity to talk to someone that had gone through that is advocating <laughs> for mental health, who's also in our scene. I mean, yeah. I don't know anyone else. So he came to me, which was interesting. He came to me and said he'd already followed the man. He really liked um, Cannibal a lot. It kind of put us on the map for him. I don't think he'd really known us before. Um, so he he messaged me saying, dude, like, I want to help out. Don't really know what I'd talk about, but would you be up for it? And I was like, it was again, it was like a three o'clock in the morning thing. And I was like, <laughs> I'm just going to message him and ask if I can talk about prison. Yeah. Which is pretty scary yeah i was sat there going like what i didn't want people to realize certainly or think is that i'm advocating for someone that's done something horrific because i'm not like i can't imagine doing that I'd never advocate for something like that but what i am advocating for is that i do believe if we believe as a society in rehabilitation we also believe in supporting people's mental health coming back into yeah. society and if we don't believe in that if we because there's a lot of bravado with the rehabilitation like oh yeah we'll rehabilitate people and you listen to what he says about the US judicial system, you don't rehabilitate people. You give them a hundred quid and you say, off you go, don't join a gang again. Like, yeah, yeah. And, and also, by the way, you've been inside for six years or seven years or 10 years or 20 years. Go back to society that you have no clue about and deal with that isolation where you've had to play gang warfare for 10 years of your life. Like, it's, it's I can't insane, imagine. Yeah. yeah, and it's one of those things that I sit and I often, you know, we all got in the binge watching like, world's toughest prisons and stuff i love them they're my favorite things in the world but you know we get on those hypes and it, it, it's like a parody you know like i was sat on a call with a peer who likes our band who has split the scene in half with what happened yeah and i'm sat there the day before on an anxiety spiral going i don't know if i can do this so i sent all my questions to journalists and like did a lot of research into it and just this is the only way I could control yeah. it. But yeah, I'm sat there going, it's a live thing. I'm going to talk about this. Like, yeah, yeah. that's the crazy <laughs> thing. It's live. Like yeah. people are commenting <laughs> yeah. as well. Yeah, it was pretty tough. It was, um, but it was good. I'm glad I did it. It yeah. was, I probably won't be putting myself in as terrible position as, as that again, but he was, a, you know, he was Tim. He was great. He talked about like all of the stuff. He's super open, which is all you can ask really. Um, but yeah, different world, absolutely different world. And, I, I love Azalea Dine, so it was also a bit of a nice, nice thing yeah, to nice see. Yeah, nice bonus. Yeah, definitely. Like you say, it would have been hypocritical 
kind of to not do it if we believe in rehabilitation. So also, if I believe in what is safe space for, like why am I doing these safe space Sundays? Yeah. I'm doing them because I need. I want everyone with mental health struggles to have a voice and be able to talk about stuff. Well, a guy has come to me who all of those things that I mentioned before, and I go, "Now nah, you're right, mate," because it it might be a bit touchy and it may piss some people off or it might lose me some followers like fuck that like exactly yeah just gonna stick it up there and we'll just write the questions and you know i had to be really careful i don't want to sit there and venerate what's gone on and like he was quite careful i think in some places to like shunt us on a little bit in time and you know what like we just got to do what we do really i didn't make any bones about it yeah no, absolutely absolutely i was <laughs> it was one of my thought process when we were I saw that obviously you were doing like the series of like safe space and stuff like that. And I saw that you spoke to Tim. I was like, oh, I wonder, I wonder <laughs> if it's an option to get him on the podcast. Because was at the point of where we're like, right, we need to see guests for this year and see where we go. Yeah. And enough, it, it, it hit me. There was like, I wouldn't be able to go on to a conversation and do justice and I'd give a, an, an intelligent enough conversation to be able to go this is sort of worth your time. I know that's a really weird way of phrasing it, but it'd be kind of like, I'd be too intimidated to be able to go like, so, uh, <laughs> do you want to I talk don't... through it? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think you would, man. Like, I, I think I think we've all got to push ourselves in places. Like, and for me as well, some of my anxiety things, like it could, an imposter for me as well, like it could really put me in a place where I did nothing and I didn't push myself. So like, we're all like that man we'll all be our own worst enemy and not do stuff because we think you know we don't add value to it and the only yeah. way to know is by doing it yeah exactly. and actually when you get to the end of it you know i got to the end of that interview and was like it was a good interview it was tough i was sweating my nuts off and like it was hard <laughs> even you know even something little like i did joel Dommer, you know and actually for our our era like joel is he's a really famous dude like really fun. and he was the coolest you know, I was a bit nervous because I he has, and he he won't mind me saying it because we do talk now. And I I sent him a message and I was a bit like, "Would you be up for this?" And he was like, "Yeah, absolutely, would be well up for this." Followed me back. I was like, "Sick, we're in now." Like, and that's generally how I've done it. I've gone key people and I've said, "Would you be up for doing it?" And or they followed me by seeing it. Now that's kind of the the technique. Now yeah. people are going, "Oh, this is really cool. I want to be part of it." Um, as all things do, like podcasts and everything. So he he um. He was like, yeah, let's do it. Sure thing. I was like, this date, how about that? Like, and it was really soon. It was like a week later that with this conversation, I was like, like, is that all right? He's like, mate, I'm not doing anything. It's lockdown. It was over. The, obviously that was between Christmas and new year. I'm happy to do it on that day. I was like sick. And then I, I posed a question. I was like, would you be up for me putting a graphic together? Because I, you know, with someone as high profile as him, I was like, he might not want to do that. He definitely won't post about it, which he didn't, which I don't blame him for. Um, and so I went and did it. So before hearing the answer, I was like, fuck it. I'll just do it. I've got what Photoshop on my phone. And as you've seen, it's a really simple graphic. It just takes their photo out, chuck another photo in and do it. But I'd yeah. Googled the photo. So I'd never even asked him about the photo and stuff, which I do now. Um, and I sent him the graphic and he didn't reply. He didn't reply for four days. Oh, shit. And I was like, and I, I you did that horrible thing where you don't want to message someone but you do message someone and yeah, I messaged yeah. him like a day later and was like, no worries if you know, you want to change or you don't want me to post it. Like, just let me know. And then again, didn't message me for two days. And I was like, Oh no. And he saw it. I saw it. You know, it says scene. Yeah. Doesn't it? Oh, it's I, horrible. I was like, oh, no, no, no. Like I've, I've been too keen. Like, and that's in my head. And like, I sit there and I think now, and like when we talk, he was like, I love your band. Like, I love your music. And like, so we're on like a level in his head, you know? And, to me, I'm sat there and yeah, I put him up here and I'm like, he's gone, oh, what a twat. And like, I'm, uh, he's in my head, he's going, <laughs> yeah. oh, look at this guy Googling an image of me. Like, what is that guy? Like, and that's what I'm telling myself in my head. Yeah. And he messaged me and went, oh, mate, so sorry. I never look at Instagram DMs. I only just saw your one. Here's my WhatsApp and here's my number. And Sick. we're just talking on, on WhatsApp. And it's like, that was just such a telling moment for me and my mental health of like, you've gone and through, 2500 scenarios of how he thinks you're an idiot and too keen and then you're literally in the same breath you've got his whatsapp and you're doing the thing two days later and he's really into it yeah. you know and it's just crazy you just, just, in your own just shows, like, never never doubt yourself in that sense like i know i've got a good platform but like i'm not the biggest frontman in the world i don't have the most amount of followers in the world but like 
it does show that, especially at the moment, people are up for talking about it, you know, and just yeah. just having a conversation. And that's like the benefit of this safe space stuff, I think. Well, it's not something you, you're new to because you did that on the previous tour, didn't you? You worked with venues and created a, a safe space, which I have, no one else does that. And it's such a, a <laughs> well, nice it thing it to hear um, about. Who was it that did it? Was it um, Milk Teeth, I think, did it? They oh, did okay. it. Yeah, so they were they did like arts and crafts, so they did I think on the way. But um, yeah, they did like a couple while they were on tour, which I thought was an amazing idea. Um, I I think we did it literally. I think about the same time we were on the same label as well, so it just looked like some label fabrication. <laughs> Never was, but yeah, we talked about that actually. Um, both of us like, oh my god, it's amazing that we did that at the same time. But yeah, like yeah, did the say so is non profit as well, so we didn't overly work with venues. Ports and Pyramids was the only one we worked with because I also didn't want it to be like a glorified meet and greet. And for me, like in my head, I was like, it's all free. And like, people didn't have to have a ticket and stuff. But like, if you said we set up a load of chairs in, you know, courts and pyramids in the middle of the room and you've got the stage and our banner and it just makes the whole thing feel a little bit conceited and not safe, actually completely opposite. People would be like, there he is in his prime. That's what I do. And that's what I'm coming to see later. Like they're not going to open up in the way. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we worked with a load of nonprofit organizations cafes and nail bar in glasgow and um a load of charities as well in nottingham we did a mental health charity with cardiff we did heads above the waves um clothing company yes. which was which was great not but it was like whatever it was like so loose like we're going to be here at this time and that was quite nerve-wracking as well so like cardiff like four people turned up it's fine like it is what it is it was a weekday whatever but i got into the rhythm by the time like it got to like nottingham there was Nottingham, there was like 20 people there. Um, Manchester was like 50 people there. London, there was about 25, 30 people there. So, and loads of people who weren't even going to the show, they didn't even know who we were there, but they were family members that had said, oh, you should go to that, which was, that was the best bit. You know, we had people, if someone came out as gay for the first time, like ever, that they've ever said it, um, which was i mean that is it isn't it like, that's yeah. why you do it and someone also admitted um not admitted but like talked about being abused as when they were younger um and their partner was there and they'd never ever told their partner about that you know it was a, a girl had been abused when she was younger um and was talking about it and and yeah it was like you feel so safe in this environment to talk about that and then we talked to her about like you know, you could do this with the authorities or we've got this kind of counseling because every single one had a mental health practitioner there who was just someone that we had people who were people that come to shows. And that's kind of the weird thing with me now because I'm known in the NHS and I'm known actually <coughs> fairly wide in the NHS and what I do, I'm asked to do talks and stuff because it's such a weird story, me being a front man and doing that. And I'm also in the band. So you get loads of people now who are like practitioners that proper and clinical psychologists that are also metal fans and they'll be like, Oh, come, I'll come do a talk there. And I'm like, this is insane. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's, it's a good thing. Cause th- there's never, there's never been like that sort of thing for people. And it's breaking down that stigma that people have against it. Yeah. And it also just shows that you can do it. Like, yeah. and I know it sounds like I'd love to put, you know, say the biggest priority of doing that is because of all the stuff you've just said, which is like, you know, it's breaking down the stigma and we're having that conversation. That's the aim, you know, that is absolutely the aim. But, you know, in a very base level, it just shows that it doesn't take a lot of effort to have a conversation. Yeah. That's the biggest thing for me. Like, yes, it was organization, but I put out a tweet and within three days I had all the venues booked. Like, and that wasn't me running around doing venues. It was easy. It was not hard to do that. The effort was hard, you know, sometimes, you know, heavy, heavy conversations, knowing that in one hour's time, I'm going to be on stage singing some of the heaviest songs. Like, you know, for me, The Grey was really tough on that tour Um, and like releasing that and knowing that the album's coming and talking about it. And every interview was like, which I never really realized when we did Cannibal. I don't know why, like, and Dav did sit me down with our manager. We had a big conversation about like keeping me safe in like my own head. Because it yeah. was the first time we've ever done it where it's like Dan is going to be doing 100% of the interviews about the context yeah. of this album because it was about me. So, And that's the first time we've ever done that. So like that was a weird moment um, and I had to protect myself. But actually, as far as the safe spaces go, they were easy. It's what yeah. I do. like, And I do it at work. Like, So it was like I just took along my little, like uh, I bought like a um, whiteboard, sticky whiteboard thing. Yeah. Off we go. 
just talk about what we need to talk about. And it was, it was really good fun, actually. Good. Um, so like the reason we haven't spoke about Cannibal yeah. is because... You hate it. How dare you? <laughs> How did you? No, 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 not at all. Um, I actually love the record. But, um, I'm here. On your, your YouTube I, did my re- I did my research as well, guys. <laughs> you already know. Yeah. Uh, no, but on your YouTube channel, you've kind of changed your content where it's you speak about the writing process and that's usually something I'd ask, but there's no mm. point me asking you the same question. <laughs> yeah, we've got an hour's worth of video for that one. Just yeah, exactly. it. yeah. It's a great video, but I do want to ask, how was it to work with Dan Weller again? Yeah. Like awesome, man. Like that guy is a genius. Like he is. And like, you know, we've, we've known Dan since portraits. Like he, yeah. well, he recorded casting shapes for us in 2008. So like, he no 2007 was casting shapes so he we have known dan for a long long time and have known sixth for even longer than that you know and and one of my my first ever proper show that i went to was pitch shifter and sixth at the wedge of dreams and uh, not wedge of dreams ports and pyramids and that was one of my first shows that i ever went to so a lot of respect for him i was 17 when we recorded portraits so he guided me through like recording and you know and for that album it was like in the metal scene at the time like it was it was good man it popped off like people knew us like and it was a really strange time that way like i look back now and we were probably 20 times smaller than what we are now as far as sales and stuff go but like that was a special time for music you know malify span like were there like us you had you know the big three so you had like bring me gallows were uh and shikari were like doing they were the top of the scene and they were doing like 600 caps which is it just blows my mind and we bury your dead were up there and you'd have like never say die come through and all this kind of stuff and like it was that era so like dan kind of like helped me be me and like and obviously i changed my vocals massively from portraits onwards and like had that whole stuff going on but like to not see him and then go through like union and runes and earthbound which were all great albums like i will and don't look back on them and think badly of them at all but like we're all so different like unions completely different to runes runes is completely different to earthbound like earthbound is probably back to like more like lionheart kind of sound um but yeah i mean he gets us black flame was a super successful album um which is funny because the uh the only criticism a lot of people have got about um black flame is how it sounds so it's funny that we went back to the guy who made it sound like that so but no he, he's, a song, he's a songwriter as well so like he yeah, helps yeah. us a bit with pre-production so we tend to write all of our songs anyway um and then we just work with dan and say like do we rip that apart do we put that together like so he helps us with that um he's the most anally attentive person to like sound that you will ever meet like i'll never forget one of the stories i've got of dan is portraits and he um he just stopped something once and was like stop 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 we were recording vocals so like, stop 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 no guitars guitars because we were doing had the amp room so like, stop 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 we can't keep recording that something's wrong and he walks into the room where all the amps were he goes all the way into a cupboard right at the back of the cupboard he pulls all of this stuff out and there was a snare left on and on a <laughs> uh, <laughs> this layer, put it all back in and he was like listen it's not there now we're like all right mate fuck it now <laughs> that's the kind of level that we're talking about and with like black flame it's the first time we introduced um synths like we'd never had backing tracks and we were like a little bit like oh we never had backing tracks <laughs> like never played to a click <laughs> and it's like yeah we never played to a click and we were the most untimed band <laughs> ever heard. it was like everything was like 25 times faster we thought we were in like m- like a speed metal band or something but like <laughs> like so we got to the stage where we we're like okay like black flame we want to do this and i remember dan just getting pissed as a far like wine and we we stayed in like this mansion so it's like it's like a what well, i'd say a mansion like a stately house um amazing place and um i'd hear dan just out of his mind drunk just like with all these synths around him just like <laughs> like honestly you've never heard noises like it yeah. he, and that's what made the soundscape behind the record and actually for oh, us like, because then we played to click live because we wanted to obviously play the songs how they were intended like it changed our band like honestly like playing because we don't have like guitars on backing tracks or anything like that or vocals because it's just not us like it's just not for me I, I couldn't do it as a vocalist i had no knock in anyone but i just i'm so insecure <laughs> about my voice that i'm like oh 
I couldn't have my voice in the in the background because yeah, I'd be like, yeah. oh, am I actually good? And um, <laughs> who knows? I'm still asking that question myself. Um, but he, yeah, but like that changed. I remember like seeing him. He came to London. It was a beautiful moment actually. Like we played um, played Coco on, and we sold Coco out on Black Flame. And no, we didn't. We sold four them out on Black Flame. And I remember seeing him, and, and we talked about it after, and he was like, "That is." that's how it was intended. And I remember him saying those words to me, like that's how the record was intended. And, uh, and then obviously we played Black Flame in full and he saw that, which was great. Um, Cause we did forum once, forum twice. And we did Coco once, Coco twice. So yeah, we've done that a couple of times. And then, and then with Cannibal, we just knew, like we knew what we were doing, knew how it was going to sound. We knew we were going to have synths in the background. It was nowhere near as intense as like thingy was, because I think the thematics of the record took over and yeah, so yeah. Dan, I got put on a handheld mic, um, which I wanted to try because I knew um, Trevor from Unearth had recorded on a SM58 and he just recorded running around a studio. And like, there's a video, an amazing video documentary of Unearth. You should watch it with, if you haven't already, because he builds like a little sofa and like he has like his own booth. So obviously a vocal booth and he puts a sofa in it and he puts like a little TV in it and he puts like a lamp in it. And he's just, it literally looks like a music video and he's running around backwards and forwards just because it made him feel comfortable. Some vocals he sat down, like Mitch Lucky used nice. to do that as well with the um, with the SM9. He used to like hold it and cup it, yeah. which is really unheard of. You usually produce like, do not touch it's the SM9. It's a big no-go, that. Yeah, it's like <laughs> this big. And it's like, but it, some of Mitch's vocals, the really low ones are done like that. So I was like, I'm, I'm going to give it a go. Like Billy Idol recorded his whole career I'm not a massive Billy Idol fan. I don't know why I'm citing him, but he did. Um, he recorded his whole career and it's super crisp. And I was like, how'd you get that off an SM58? Like beta version, like battered, like grill on it. Like, and I, But I knew that I was better live than I was on record. I always knew that. Like that was just something I, in my head, I prided myself on longer screams, higher screams, lower screams live than I do on record. So I was like, well, there's something in that, surely. So yeah, got the SM58 out and it it took Cannibal to the like, next level for vocals like that's where some of the like so for choke for example that's where that vo voice comes from because i do that live but i've never done it on record so it's just really interesting really interesting process but dan is a massive part of that because he made it happen you know yeah was there a lot of that changing things up or trying new things when making the record yeah uh, i mean we're a weird band i'd say probably not <laughs> more than like most bands because we're really comfortable like you know we're all in our 30s and and like, yes, that's not a really old, but it's also like, it's old when you think about when I joined the band, like I was 16. So we've yeah. done a lot of new things. We've done a lot of like things in our time. And like, I said this to someone the other day, like it's very rare being in a band for like 15 years and having new experiences. Like it, it's really rare, you know, we'll play massive shows and we'll play different countries and stuff. So it's always a celebration when we play a country we haven't played before because we're like sick we played this we played germany 600,000 times so like it's really <laughs> nice to play somewhere else and um and so in that way like we're also a band that thrives on being comfortable as well so we're a band that thrives on like understanding what we're trying to do when we achieve it that's like this is the whole time's been so hard for us because we are a live band like we thrive when it's like you're going on tour guys for 6 weeks and you're going to work yeah. We're not a band that's, you know, we're not a sleeps, for example, that are like all super creative, all of like, that's what they live and breathe that band. Yeah. Like, and that's their life. And they will bloody paint a sleeps logo on a t shirt. And, and that's their productive, like, insane day. Like, and feel productive and feel in it. Like, we aren't that band. Like, we never have been. We're a band that, like, we'll get a tour and we'll go, we're going to work. And we're going to yeah, be yeah. the best we can possibly be. We're going to smash every crowd to absolute bits. Like that's our aspiration every time, even if it's 10 people in front of us all just pissed out of their mind in a field. Like that's still to us. We're like, we're going to do it. And for some people, they may think they don't do it. <laughs> like some people will think that. Um, but for us, the mindset never changes. We get off tour and we're knackered because we'd be like, we gave it everything. And, and that's the same with my ethos of meeting fans like and people because one it's that's my job like that's what i believe in so every day so i will be there every day same as the safe spaces every day like it's just one of those things so we put in all that effort but it's more condensed into that time so so back to like the question which i've completely negated um around like 
and new things like studio probably the last two albums have been the most different we've done but in a comfortable setting because they've been in the same place which is really weird and it might yeah. be why we did it because um but it's hard to tell what the next record would be because would we stick to that formula because it's done really well but i don't know we're going to be in a really weird position i think when we start having that conversation because like we haven't even got started with cannibal like yeah released cannibal and didn't play a show yeah, and but you're itching to play that live. Yeah. Mate, it's going to be nigh on, well, it's a year, year June, year July. It's going to be pushing a year and five months, I I think, anyway, before we play a show. Jesus. Like, and we that's an album cycle. That is yeah. literally yeah. the moment we would go, we're either going to release a deluxe or another songs, or we're going to be in the studio recording the next album and we'll put a new song out. So we're literally <laughs> going to have done all of that the entirety of Black Flame campaign was two years and two years and a month before we yeah. started like putting new stuff out, and we're nearly have done have done that in by the time we play another show. I think anyway, I can't see. It. I mean, I crazy. I'm hoping that the the vaccine will take hold and we suddenly everything's fine. But like, yeah, it's like you you know Who knows we're at in this point. This is a... Jay, Jay said it perfectly the other day where it was like he did he put it quite quite aptly, which is. You know, on the tier of like things that get back to normal, music is at the bottom. As we all know, the government hasn't supported it. It, yeah. it doesn't support it in normal times. It's not going to support it now. Um, no. Closely followed by probably the NHS, but no, that's up a bit now. <laughs> but the industry's down here with the arts, you know? Yeah. yeah. As long as, if Boris Johnson doesn't like it, then no one's getting anything for it. Um, and then in the music industry, metal shows will be at the bottom of that pile because of the not only because of the perception of metal and people don't give a shit about it, but it's also the the nature of the shows. Like for us, there's a big reason why we wouldn't do a drive-through show. Yeah, it, it would be mm. pointless. Like it would have no feeling to it whatsoever. It's probably a reason why we haven't done a live show, stream because like we're holding on to the fact that hopefully the first show back will be a proper show and we can give it and everyone loses their mind. But you know, we're gonna have to do it. <laughs> it's yeah. <laughs> a wait and see at this point isn't it that's it mate that's it right so let's skip in skipping topics now and being conscious of time we'll start yeah, with the uh, plenty with, of time yeah here. No, it's all good it's all good <laughs> so got the... as i said you're making you're making my day a lot better guys so i really appreciate that that's appreciate well, likewise yeah my quite is likewise liquid liquid <laughs> <ways. laughs> <laughs> Right, so we'll start with the first segment. So, what is your favorite scary movie? You're going to hate me for this if you're kind of, and you are connoisseurs of, um, I'm seeing a Halloween, I'm seeing Cape, Camp Crystal Lake behind you, Pearson. So, <laughs> you're, you guys know it. Um, but <laughs> I've seen a lot of books and either a lion or a dog behind you, Lynn. So, <laughs> <laughs> that's a lion. <laughs> Amazing. But, um, yeah, I mean, so there's two. I'll, I'll say two. So, for me, I, I do really like Sinister. I do and it's some Ooh, people yeah. some people don't like it so some people really don't like it but the reason why i like sinister is because i think it's the this and this my second choice will be this is that reason as well but before it sinister there's been so long since the friday the 13th the you know um halloween's the you know all of all of the kind of character based horror where it was like or slasher like where it's like you've got somebody or something it's a bit mysterious it's a bit supernatural they're the person killing or doing stuff and yeah. Yeah. it's been a long long time since we hear like felt that as a character and Bagul obviously then came up and it was a bit supernatural ethan hawk is an amazing actor um and it was that fear i love super eight as well i absolutely i'm a sucker for like a handheld weird grainy super eight like i love that stuff so the premise of it i was hooked i was like and the yeah. videos of the like the shock factor of like it's coming they're gonna watch another video and it's gonna be horrible and yeah and the supernatural like um dubious moments in there but great jump factor um i just thought it's really original in its nature which i thought is, is very hard to do i'm sure in horror at the moment no, I agree. It was a, when I watched that for the first time, it was really refreshing. Like I said, because uh, like the paranormal stuff started getting like a hold of like you know what I mean. It was right. Like, that's all you saw coming into the cinema all the time. You know what yeah. I mean? And then uh, yeah, something like Sinister came out, and as you said, like Bagul's a character is just creepy as fuck to begin with. But those scenes with the Super Eight, 
like they come on so and it's, it's really, it it looks looks really uneasy. Yeah, the Lord Mower bit is one of the oh, fuck moments where you're like, <laughs> what? Because th that's the bit, that's the best bit about it because you're like, what's happening? Like the first shot of the hanging of the tree where the where it cuts and you're like, yeah, oh my God. And I'm a sucker as well for a horrific ending. And it was, it was the classic. There's <laughs> ain't no happy ending, man. Yeah. Like We're not going to that's so rare in horror to have an uh, unhappy ending, especially these days, man. Like you yeah. know, I I'm not a huge um I'm not a huge hater of like Insidious and stuff like because I do actually think they they play a part in the horror industry like a bit more acceptable and they probably pull a lot of people into into horror. I think things like Insidious and I I really like them actually. Um, got a bit Alice in Wonderland in places, but like <laughs> it it I love them and for that very reason that I prefer Sinister because. You know, Insin Insidious. Um, what are the other ones? You've got um, what's the ones that's about the Warrens? So you've the got con the Conjuring, 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 yeah. Conjuring yeah. Annabelle, those kind of things. They yeah. all, you know, for a fact, you are gonna get to a stage. They're either gonna do the corny like, "Is it all over?" thing, yeah, um, or they're gonna do it's a happy ending. Everyone's fine, like, yeah. And that's the one thing with like Sinister that didn't do that, and Sinister Two didn't do that. And I was I was quite a fan of Sinister Two as well, which is a People don't like it, but I think everyone's going to hate of it, hate on it because it's a bit, oh, it's the second one. But then the <laughs> other one that I was going to say, and it's not really a horror, but it's more slasher, is, I mean, I would argue one of the greatest franchises of all time and the only one to battle against the Halloweens and the Friday the 13th is Saw. Like, it is oh, one yeah, of the, yeah. bar yeah. the last two, because they were fucking awful. But, like, <laughs> I would say that Saw is the last proper one like that, where it's slasher... I mean, there was no, like, there was nothing, and it, and we're talking about original. Like Bagul's not original, but it's really nice to see it resurgence. Saw nothing yeah. like it. There it's was like torture, torture porn in it. That's what's like uh, what they call it, it. But there but was, it was nothing like, like what it. Hostel tried to do, but Hostel did it so badly. Like, and yeah. Hostel was terrible. Like, and I, I really, I, I like, I hated Hostel because I thought it was like a really poor man's like um, Saw, and I think we saw the psychological element of it made it like yes you knew the traps and they were going to be horrible and it was going to be gross and like you're going to see someone's hand chopped off or something which is rough but it was more rough than anything and then but him as jigsaw what an evil character a guy yeah, who's yeah. dying of cancer like who's frail like it's, it has never been done i'm telling you, it's never been done yeah, it is fantastic i love um just the twist in the first one alone speaks yeah, the second and third where they're running parallel yeah like that bit, you're like Oh, yeah, trying to get your head around it. Like, this isn't a sequel. This is going on at the same time. Oh, no. <laughs> it was nuts. But then I'm also, you know, we mentioned before, like, I'm a, I could talk to you guys about horror movies for another hour and a half. But, like, I'm... Oh, um, yeah. It's just an excuse to get you back, Danny. It, yeah, I was a big fan. <laughs> I was a fan of Paranormal Activity when it came out because I actually thought it was, again, it was, like, you know, low budget. It was the low, one of the lowest budget horror movies of all time, really. Um, and that was not happy. There was no happy ending at the end of Par yeah. Paranormal Activity. You were like, and the Paranormal Activity 2, I would say, is the best of all of them with the roving camera um, stuff, the jump moments. and But again, exactly the same feeling as Sinister, which was like, you knew when something speeds up on the camera and it stops, something's coming. Yeah, you start yeah. shitting yourself and already. That's You're the like, bit, oh, man. Fuck, like, here we go. Yeah, and the same as Sinister. They did quite a lot right at the start, which they didn't do the Super 8 bit. He was watching bits, but didn't see it or but was on the camera and he turned and did those jump moments but like with paranormal activity they did so much that psychologically messed you it messed me up for weeks because i sat there with like noise cancelling headphones on dav so this is a cool story and i will <laughs> stop stop talking about it but um dav said to me i'd never watched paranormal activity wasn't really interested not bothered dav's a massive movie buff and loves horror movies and he loves cartoons he's he is probably better for this than me but <laughs> He said to me, oh, Paranormal Activity 2 is coming out. Do you want to go and see it at the cinema? And I was like, I haven't seen number one. He's like, watch it tonight. And it was the next day, watch it tonight. And so I watched it at like one in the morning, noise cancelling headphones, downstairs. I used to live with my parents, like downstairs in a house, older house. It wasn't old, but it was an older house, so it creaks and stuff. So I'm sat there with noise cancelling headphones on. And the noise scape, if you ever want to go back, go and watch Paranormal Activity with proper noise cancelling headphones because it travels and they'll do creaks. And what they did, and I've watched like a making of, is that they recorded a normal house sound. So what they did was they made normal house sound scary. So there's moments where you just hear someone walk and yeah. you'd be like, 
is that a creek? And then it stopped. Or you'd hear the boiler turn on. And so they did that to mess with people's brains. So when it did step up and it stepped up quickly when it started going, so like the sheep fell off and was it the sheep fall off or did they knock it off? And it, I like whoever planned that in storyboarding is an absolute genius. Like, and so, yeah, I mean, that messed me up because then I was laying in bed the next night so I, and something in a creek and I'd be like, oh, <laughs> <God."> <laughs> yeah. I just started doubting myself completely, but. Yeah, that's the, that's a sign of a great horror movie, though, especially a psychological one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely. This, the, I mean, after he got to like the seventh one, I was kind of fucking drained from it. I was <laughs> like, ghost, why? Ghost dimension. <laughs> it, all got a, yeah. it all got a bit of adventure time to me, but like, yeah. the, I would say number three is one of the best ever horror movies until the last ten minutes where they where you see the witches. That was the bit yeah. that just I was like rubbish. Marked ones was really good because it was completely different. Um, I thought that was a fantastic movie, but. Yeah, ghost dimension and stuff. It's like what? Yeah. But saying that, and I could go on about paranormal activity for ages, but the um, the clever bit I hated the movie number four, which was the I think that might have been ghost dimension or something. But number four, they introduced the connect, which I thought was an inspired thing to do. And they basically, you know, the connect, you know how connects work, right? They shoot out thousands yeah. of laser beams into the they're always shooting it out so when you come and wave at it it pops up so they shot that so you could see the laser beams and so they and if you haven't seen it it's really cool because she's playing connect and you see the laser beams and then you see it it pick an outline of someone behind her what? and walk past uh, oh, oh man, it was like that. genius i was like and you see <laughs> it and you'd walk past so you'd see and you you know like because it's dots you wouldn't see like the proper like that's a person you just yeah. see disconnect a laser and then oh, you feel like, oh, it's genius. Hey? It was horrible to watch. I will, um, jumping back to Saw before we move on, if you have an Apple TV or like buy any films, they have every Saw movie for £10 on the Apple oh. Store at the minute. I'll tell you a nice story with uh, Saw. I, my other half, my wife, hates horror movies with a passion, despises <laughs> them, freaks her out, doesn't like it. Uh, and when we first started going out, she was too polite. She was too into it. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and she goes, bring a movie around. I was like, yeah, bring a horror movie around. I don't know where I thought I was in the 80s or something or in Teen Wolf. And I thought I was going to like, <laughs> oh, she's going to jump on me and it's going to be all romantic. And like, I don't know what I was thinking. Um, but I, I brought around, I brought around one to three of Saw and we watched them back to back, right? Yes. Four yeah. hours of like, torture and jump scenes and stuff and she apparently was there for four hours not watching a tv <laughs> she was that's like <laughs> yeah it's really good <laughs> yeah that, 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 that's a story that we've like it's our like one of our relationship stories where she's like i can't believe i sat there for four and a half hours and watched the <laughs> movies that i hate that's not my missus that to be honest <laughs> now she'd just be like fuck no <laughs> yeah. we've been married for two years and we've been together for like 13 or 14 so like she she definitely would tell me where to go now not polite anymore that's what you're saying <laughs> <It's gone. laughs> that's it. right so jump into our second regular thing what pisses you off the most what is your pet peeve well i've got lots of things that piss me off as you can imagine i could go off on another hour and a half rant about like people not supporting mental health and all that kind of stuff but i'll say the basic one which is people eating like it is you know they say it's a mental mental health disorder it's also a sign of a bit of a psychopath if you have horrible vicious thoughts about people when they open with their mouth open or they cham their lips and they go i'm one of those people i you can be the nicest person in the world and that's it like you are dead to me and i'll probably <laughs> i will probably imagine how you're gonna die if you're, <laughs> oh, literally my. like Saw style. Uh, yeah, <laughs> saw yeah. playing out. In my head, I'm like, well, there's some stairs there, so it wouldn't be that hard. Um, and it's like, and, and and to me, that warrants it, you know. And I'm like, when you think about it rationally, you're like, Jesus Christ, like, what were you thinking? But yeah, I despise it. I hate it. It's and like, there's also another thing, and I hope none of you guys do it because you'll hate me. But Dawson does it, so I'm allowed to say it. Is like when people go like before they say something so like yeah yeah so i'll do that and you're like Netflix, how yeah. how do you make that noise <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's like it's hard and, and that's what i think about eating as well that's the bit that ju i justify the murderous thoughts in my mind um 
because of it's actually harder to eat with your mouth open than it is eating with your mouth closed. So I don't really understand why people do that. Um, but I mean, each their own. It's just my problem. It's not their problem. They can do what they want. So no, I think it warrants. Big, 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 big. Yeah. yeah, I do. I don't get it. It's death. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he stares in front of Camp Crystal Lake. Yeah. <laughs> he says, like, <laughs> so we've, had, we've had that before with like, um, I can't remember who brought it up, but someone said forks as well. When ben from say, LTA. That's yeah. what it was. And and the, uh, they bite down on the forks when they're eating and you can hear oh, it yeah. scraping. My, my and wife stuff. hates that. Yeah. She hates metal on teeth. She hates ice cubes <laughs> on teeth as well. It it drives them nuts. So I like, I love chewing ice cubes. It's like my. <laughs> Like, I don't know why, because I don't, I don't have sensitive teeth at all. And he, like, as you can probably tell, I, I did whiten my teeth a long time ago. But they, um, like, they, are they not sensitive at all? Never had sensitive teeth. Never had a fill-in touch word. Like, it is what it is. But she despises it. She's got <laughs> such sensitive teeth. And I'm there, like, crunch, 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 crunch. <laughs> she hates it so much. Right, I think that just about wraps it up then yeah, before we end up. We've, uh... we've taken way yeah. too much of your time. I know, I know man. <laughs> so you've you well, give me up, homies. Uh, likewise. So we'll do a, a fake goodbye and then we'll we'll end it with a bit of info for you. No so thank you very much for coming on the podcast, mate. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dan. Cheers, man. Thank you. You sexy boys. <laughs> uh, <I'm... laughs> You know what? I'm so happy I have that recording on audio. I'm taking <laughs> it out. That's Over the best into. ending yet. <laughs> That's going to be your new like ident for this. Like, what's the show called? Sexy boys, sexy mats. Yeah, that's what we've got to change it to. <laughs> oh. What an episode that was! Episode 46 of an AFL podcast with the awesome Danny Winter Bates of Berry Tomorrow. Don't forget to check out the recent album, Cannibal, over on Spotify or wherever you get your music. Even, especially go buy it on iTunes or go to the store and buy it physically because you know that benefits the band a lot more better than Spotify does. Um, but we're not going to answer that right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't, don't forget to head over to his Instagram as well to go check out his series of Safe Sundays, uh, talking about mental well-being with people such as Rue Reynolds. And uh, yeah, that's me. And while you're here, um, if you scroll down in this description, you'll see that we link to all our other episodes and our Discord where you can come and have a chat, find out who we're talking to before we release the episode, get your questions in. Um, yeah, and then we got 45 other episodes to go listen to. That's weird, 45. 45. Hell yeah, man. Um, yeah, so go check them out as well. Uh, but thank you for not stopping it at this point if I'm still talking. So, Yeah. Have a listen to 47. I'll be out soon. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. Hey, <guys>. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs>